All right, if you take your Bibles, I want to uh, share with you from uh, the Gospel of John to begin with. I just want to quickly, really quickly run through a couple of points we often look at and we often think of when it comes to Christ and who He is. Uh, one of our purposes for holding a service out here is uh, we're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that word gospel, it simply means good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, there's a few aspects as to why it's good news. And a lot of the reason why it's good news is because of the state of the world. Because there's not a lot of good news that goes on in the world. And we might think that might be a thing of recent times. But truth be told, right throughout the history of the world, uh, there's been hardships and heartache both on a, on a national and international level as well as just on a personal level in our own lives, our own homes, uh, our own uh, dealings. Life gets tough at times and there is, uh, there's, there's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in the gospel of John we're introduced uh, to a couple of points of who Jesus is. I was starting to turn there and then I closed it. John chapter 1. And I just want to go quickly here as it's a couple of points we often look at. But in John chapter 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. If you go down to verse 14 it says, The Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Gospel of John here introduces who Jesus is. And of course, we see who Jesus is in the history books. Here's the, the man of Galilee. Uh, might be known as a carpenter. Might be known as a carpenter's son. Might be known as a teacher or a prophet. Of course, in the Scriptures, we see He is uh, the Messiah. He is the Christ. And the Bible makes it plain that He was God in the flesh, that uh, in Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. In us is the spirit of man. In Christ was the spirit of God. God was indwelling in Him. Oh, we just sang that song, Christ liveth in me. And it sings about the truth that, uh, that Christ and the, the spirit of God can come and dwell in the hearts of mankind, that when God made us, when He created us, and that's who we learn about God to be in the Gospel of John, that He's the Creator. It points that by Him were all things made, specifically by Christ were all things made. And when He made us, He designed us, if you like, with a place for Him to dwell. We're told that uh, this is a tabernacle, a tent, that the Lord can dwell in. And uh, the purpose for us as humans is to have fellowship with God. And when we don't have that, when we don't have that fellowship, then things are out of place. We're uh, not as we're supposed to be. And so when we look at the good news of Jesus Christ, it's very important that we take into account and remember the fact that who Christ is, is He's our Creator. In Jesus we live and move and have our being. Uh, without Him, we can do nothing and everything we have is because God decided to make us and uh, put us into existence. And we can often understand that if we think about the fact that you know, we've all made things before, uh, whether it be something great and grandiose or whether it be something small and trivial, we've made stuff before and before we made it, it didn't exist. And then after we made it, it existed. Perhaps it was a song, perhaps it was a poem, perhaps it was a story, perhaps it was a pavlova. Uh, before there was no pavlova, then you got to making it and there was a pavlova. Well, that was the state that we were in. Without God, we have nothing because we didn't make ourselves. We're not an accident. We're not just... We didn't just pop here by circumstance. And uh, we were deliberately made and deliberately made by the hand of God. And so when we look at the good news of Jesus Christ, we need to look at the, that uh, Jesus is our, is our creator and understand the creative side of God. But not only was He cre our creator, if you go to John chapter 3, and perhaps the most famous passage in the Bible, perhaps the most well-known uh, and it tells us that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that not only did God make us, but He purchased us. There's a story of a young boy who made a boat. It's quite a long story, but you can simplify it down. He made himself a wooden boat. He sent it sailing down the, down the creek, only to have, to have it sail off into the distance, and he lost it. He was sad and disappointed that he'd lost the little boat he made. 
And uh, a few days later, he was walking through the street and he saw his boat for sale in there in the shop window. Someone had found his boat, taken it to the second hand store and put it up for sale. And he walked in there and he said to the shop owner, he said, that's my boat. And the shop owner said, no, that's mine. And he said, no, it's mine. I made it. And the shop owner said, well, if you'd like it, you have to buy it. And so the little boy took his money out of his pocket and he bought back the boat that he had made. And as he walked out, he said, you're twice mine. I made you and now I've bought you. And that's the reality of why Christ came. He made us, but we were lost in sin. And if we don't have to look to Adam and Eve to see sin. Truth be told, we can just look in the mirror. We can just look in the mirror and see those dark thoughts, those, those things that get on us, those things that we know aren't right, those things that we keep hidden, those things that we keep concealed. And, and really, the Gospel of John in chapter 3, it tells us that. Men, can't, men, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You know when the most amount of murders are committed? In the dark. You know where most of the crimes are committed? In the dark. You might happily leave your house unlocked if you go away for the day, but you'll lock it up at night time. You might park your car up on the street and leave it unlocked during the day, but you'll lock it at night. We know that in the darkness, that's when, that's when the evil is committed so often. And it's just a testimony of how, how far we've got away to God that we, we go and commit these things in broad daylight now. And so mankind, we can see in, our, in ourselves, we're prone to lie and cheat and steal and, and to, to destroy. And the Bible says there's someone that that's their business. And it's called, a, it's called the robber, the, the robber, the thief. Uh, the devil is known as that. He comes forth but to, no, to do nothing but to lie, to kill, and destroy. And so because of the destruction that's in this world, the sin that's in this world, God came in and He sent His Son. He said, I don't want to just make you. I want to purchase you back to me. I've made you. I've given you life. But now sin has taken that life from you. The life you're supposed to have, you don't have. The joy that's supposed to be in the world and in your life, the hope, the deliverance, the freedom that's supposed to be there in, in fellowship with God, just having, having us, our life the way God designed it to be. And so Christ said, for you to have that, I'm going to come and purchase you back. And if you ever wanted to understand what, uh, what you were worth to God, you know, sometimes we're not worth much to ourselves. Sometimes we're not worth much to other people. But if you ever want to wonder how much you are worth to Christ, don't look at what He can do with you. Don't look at what you can do for Him. Don't measure your worth by what you think you might be able to bring to God, but measure your worth by what God brought for you. You know what He did? He came down and stepped down out of heaven 2,000 odd years ago, put on flesh, lived His life on this earth, committed nothing wrong, and he yielded up his life on the cross of Calvary. He was put to death like a lamb to the slaughter. And why? For a righteous man, for a holy man, for someone who'd done no sin, why, why was he put to death? And it was a payment. It was a payment for your sins and for mine. The wages of sin, the Bible said, is death. And Christ said, I'll pay that. I'll pay that death. It's not the death of the grave, but it's the second death of, of hell and damnation, of judgment for our sins. And that brings me to the point that I wanted to look at with Christ. As we think about who Christ is, He's our Creator. And uh, as our Creator, He brought us into this world. But He's not only our Creator, He's our Savior. And as our Savior, He came down into this world to purchase us back to Him. If you're following in your Bibles, I'd like you to go right to the very end. Go to the book of Revelation and just a few chapters right from the end. Revelation chapter 19. And the beautiful thing about God is He hasn't left us guessing about what the end of things will be. He's given us the end of the story. He's given us how things pan out. He's given us His purpose and His plan. And in Revelation chapter 19, we see Jesus here spoken of in verse 11. John wrote here, I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Here in verse 13 it points out who Christ is, who it is that's, that's been spoken of here. 
on his vesture is a, on him is a vesture that's been dipped in blood talking about that sacrifice that Christ made and his name is called the word of God that word that was made flesh and dwelt among us that creative word of God that spoke you into existence and speaking of him it says in the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords and I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God here the Bible talks about Jesus and it talks about him in a way that we haven't seen the Bible says he came as a lamb the first time in the beginning he came as a creator God and and made us the second time he came he came as a as a lamb as a savior to give his life for us but the Bible talks here about a time where he will come again where the Lord will reign over this earth his title is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and what the Bible tells us is that it's appointed and under man once to die and after that the judgment that we all have to give account of ourselves one day and even the kings of this earth they don't get to be kings of this earth over nations and not have to give an account one day every evil thing every evil deed every every uh, evil conspiracy every uh, tyranny every uh, genocide everything all the evil that's ever been done one day account will be given before the king of kings and he'll give it he'll hold to account those that were in authority under him and we see that here that he was the king of kings and the lord of lords and it doesn't matter how powerful somebody is in this world it can be alexander the great who declared himself to be the greatest he's a man under authority under the authority of god and when he died he had to give an account of himself but not only at death do we have to go and stand before god the bible says here that there's one day coming a day where the lord will return Bible teaches and I believe with all my heart that 2,000 years ago God stepped out of heaven and put on the form of a babe to come as the Savior and we have that Christmas story that we get all so familiar with but he's coming again the Lord's not a distant God that sits on his, sits on his throne in a distant distant heaven uninterested in the things of earth there's not a sparrow that falls from the sky without God being aware of it let alone the evils done on this earth one day the Bible says that he'll return to reign over this earth. And when he does, he'll reign with authority, not pleading. We're told now to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, to go into the world, the world and, and preach the gospel. But the Bible talks of a day coming where the Lord will return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as we look at that, that his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head, were many, was, were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and the armies which were oh I went too far the armies which were with him in heaven followed him upon a white horse clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth a, a, a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule with them a rod of iron and he treadeth out the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath of Almighty God. It talks about that uh, he will rule and smite the nations with his wrath. And the Bible talks about those that follow God and those that, not, that, that will not. And the Bible talks about the nations. The wind always gives me grief here. The Bible talks about the nations that rise up against God. Those nations that go to war. And really, if we look at this state of play that we're in, throughout Australian history, there's been church services held out in public all throughout our history. The very first church service that was ever held, held in Australia was preached under a tree in Botany Bay. Melbourne was well known for the services and the, mean, the preaching that was done in the streets. There was tent meetings, and the MCG, one of the biggest crowds that the MCG has ever seen was the preaching of the gospel. But we live in a day and time where people have no time for the things of God and no time for the thoughts of God. And many in our societies in the world around us are at enmity, the Bible says, with God. 
and the nations of the world likewise that. And as we think about Christ and look at who He is, we need to be mindful that He's not just coming, hasn't just come as a Savior, but He's coming as a King to reign eternal and to reign over the nations that rebel against Him as well as those that yield to Him. See, often what we do is we go, is this the lifestyle I would like? Do I want to have the Christian lifestyle? Is this the add-on that I'd like to have? Do I just want to add Christianity to my social normality? But Christ isn't something we add on. He's your Creator, and you have to give an account to Him. He's your Savior, and He died for you. And He's coming again to rule. And when He does come again to rule, at that point in time, there'll only be two crowds. There'll be those that are God's and His people, and there'll be those that rise up against God and rebel against God. And we can see a snippet of it in ourselves now as to which side of that we stand on. But in the great scheme of things, as the Lord comes back one day, there is no sliding scale of, well, I just sit sort of in the middle without really an opinion. The Lord said, if you're not for me, you're against me. I ask you, where do you stand with God? We're naturally born into a state where we don't know God. And Nicodemus, he was a ruler amongst the Jewish people and he came to Jesus by night and said, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God because no man can do the things that Jesus did except God as be with him. And as he sought that answer for that, Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you don't need more knowledge. You don't need more understanding. You need to be born again. Nicodemus, with all your Bible knowledge, with everything else, you're still on the wrong side. You're at enmity with me. And you need to be made right with me. See, there's really only two places you stand, either against God or for God. He made you, and He died for you. He's already paid that price. The price has been paid, but He leaves it into your, your court as to what you want to do with that. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, but are you willing to make Him your King? He will judge you. He will reign over you. He will make His judgment on you according to the things done in this earth. It goes on, Revelation 20, to make that plain. That judge, we're judged according to the things that we've done on this earth and primarily what we've done with Jesus. And so I leave you with that question this afternoon what have you done with Jesus where does he fit in your life is he just some historical figure is he your creator and you know he died or is he your king does he reign over you does he have any place where you give account to God on this life and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior Jesus spoke to the Pharisees of his day and said unless you repent you shall all likewise perish and that repentance, that repentance is simply turning. I'm going to get Lil to come and play again and we're going to sing a song. It's, he leadeth me. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where I be, where'er I be, still tis Christ's hand that leadeth me. And the Christian walk is a walk of following Christ's leading and repentance is really that, that I'm no longer following my own lead. I'm going to trust Him that gave his life for me. I'm going to trust him that made me. I'm going to trust him that died for me. And I'm going to trust him that is king over me, whether I like it or not anyway. And I'm going to yield myself to him as king of kings and lord of lords. And repentance is simply turning from ourselves to Christ. That we repent of our sin and all we've ever done wrong in our own wicked state. And we become a follower of Jesus. That's what a Christian is. The, the disciples, the followers of Christ, were first called Christians. And so as we sing this song, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, I'd ask you to just think about whether He does lead you or not. Do you follow Him? And if you don't, will you? Will you follow Jesus? Will you allow Him to lead you in the way that He designed life to be lived? As a creator, he knows how it's to be done. And he leads us in the ways of righteousness and the ways of life.